My next guest here is a longtime friend of musicians, Reveal with Joe Kelly, and he's been to our studios several times when we were at WVOF. He's a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, Grammy Award winning Lifetime Achievement Award. He's in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, plenty of other awards. He was the principal songwriter for the Isley Brothers from 1973 to 1983, moved on to Isley, Jasper and Isley, had a smash I think it was three albums, but the biggest hit, Caravan of Love. And this man is so consistent. I believe he has 19 solo albums to his credit right now. Is that right, Chris? Uh, 17. 17. 17. Okay. I was giving you credit. <laughs> Another one coming up, so it'll, it'll be 18 soon. Yeah. You, you've got uh, – we see your – you're in your studio, I believe, and you've got all the awards, just, just a portion of the awards we're seeing, right? Yeah, it's just a small portion of one wall behind right. me. Um, and those are like covers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from other artists. Let me let me do this, hold on. Okay. Uh, there, were, there were cover covers from other artists, you know, like uh, Whitney Houston's back here, uh, you know, um, a few rap artists are back there. Right. And I got, you know, one of our gold singles right in the middle there. Right mm -hmm. there. Um, right. Um, that's that was from the Icy Brother days. Right. Um, I think I think that was Fight the Power. But um it's it's what's all over the studio, you know. It's like a it's like a small museum. <laughs> this one looks so, so when you bring your friends over and you show them it, you get you must get pummeled with a lot of questions, right? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. What's this one for? What's that one for? I got right. all my solo albums up here, you know, right. on, on either side. So it's um, it really looks good, you know. It's uh, I, I look at it sometimes and say, wow, you know, I was I must have done a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you're you're ambitious from probably yeah. a young teenager, right? Oh yeah, like when I was young, yeah. I I wanted to, you know, record music. I wanted to compose music. And um, when we started working together, the you know the six of us, the, the six uh, Isaac brothers, um, that's when that's when I started to do a lot of work uh, as far as you know producing and writing and um, even touring, doing a lot of touring. Right. You know? um, that's when I started to really write a lot, and because our career just kept you know getting better and better. Mm -hmm. And as it did, you know, we needed material, you know, uh, a record label, the record company, uh, CBS was looking for, you know, something else. And, <laughs> right. you know, every year, you know, we were uh, fortunate enough to be able to give them another album every year like that. Yeah. You know? So how does it go? I mean, you you had the older Isley brothers who were there already and you, you were with uh, two of the younger ones. How, how did it get into that you were going to be primarily the songwriter or did you just have the best ideas and how does that work? Um, it, uh, it, it just has to do with my background, you know, like since, since I was seven years old, I started to take piano lessons and, um, my teacher was a professor at, at, uh, um, at, at a university in Cincinnati mm -hmm. and he just started to teach cause I said I wanted to be a composer <laughs> when I was seven right. years old. Wow. <laughs> he goes like, okay. Um, well, then you're gonna to have to learn a lot. You're gonna to have to do a lot of work. So, when he, when he would teach, when we go over the pieces, he would go over how they were constructed too. How how the composer constructed the piece, you know, the the different harmonies, the different uh, motifs that they would use, and how right. they would come back to them. And, you know, all those things that tricks, you know, that composers would use. He would teach me and say, you know, you know, Bach did this, and you know, Beethoven would do that, and you know. Ravel will do this, you know, and that gave me a, a, a really good background in uh, how to compose a, a song, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I use that in a lot of my, my songs that, that I wrote, you know, I use some of those techniques. With, with that kind of training, you know, I've, I've talked with Bernie Worrell when he was alive and, and yourself, I always consider you guys are in the class of, you know, higher level of how they they compose and hear things um is it easier to write songs like that 
you know it's it's easier to it's it's easier if you have more exposure to um a lot of different pieces a lot of different genres like mm -hmm. i was I, I listen to classical i listen to jazz you know i listen definitely listen to r b and blues right you know all of it and it gives you a wider scope to deal with you know you you, you know sometimes okay I'll, i might put a little jazz right here you know in, in this in this song you know um another song you say okay i might add a little classical maybe on, on the intro you know what i mean right uh, to just to give it a different feel than other other music you know to to give it more of an identity you know um because it's not like highways of my life you know when that starts off it, it, it sounds different than other songs because mm -hmm. there's classical elements, you know, in that introduction. Right. And so, um, it, it does, it does kind of distinguish, uh, your music when, when you can use a lot of different types of, uh, uh genres in, in it. Now, growing up in Cincinnati, we all know Ohio. We all always have debates with listeners of the show, you know, it's all good, but Ohio, Dayton, Cincinnati, Minneapolis, Philly. Who's got the best funk coming out of there? But something about Ohio people people stand up for stand up for the funk. Yeah, it's you know it's that's that's what we heard a lot growing up. You know, it, uh, maybe it had to do with you know what the jocks were playing on the radio. You know, or, right? Or uh, maybe some groups that were playing. You know, that, that you were able to hear uh, even bands you never heard of. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that, that maybe didn't make it. You know, they they. They were uh, influenced by James Brown and, you know, other people uh, who were playing, you know, funk, you know, maybe some stack artists, you know. Uh, but that's, 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 it seems like that's what happens when, when you grow up there, you know, you, you hear, you know, a lot of blues and funk, you know, right. and maybe that's the reason, you know, you have the, the, the bands that come out of there that are they're playing a lot of funk, you know, but. Uh, I'm surprised how many how many came out of Cincinnati, you know. Yeah, I mean, you got and Dayton, you you got Zap Lakeside, right? Yeah, you got Bootsy. Bootsy you know? Yeah. Did it's, you do you know Bootsy growing up? Did you? you no, guys I didn't. That's, that's oh, the thing. Okay. I didn't know didn't know any of the uh, bands growing up because see, when I was coming up, I was also playing classical music, you know. Oh, okay. And that was a lot different <laughs> than yeah. The, you know what I mean? So, um, but then on my own, because I used to play by ear, mm -hmm. I, on my own, I would play, you know, stuff from Ray Charles, you know, uh, Jackie Wilson, Sam Cooke, you know, some of the Motown stuff. I would, I would just do that on my own. You know, uh, uh, my teacher didn't have that music. <laughs> but, right. But, you know, I was doing kind of both things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, I think that helped me a lot. It helped me a lot because sometimes if I would get stuck, you know, I would, you know, I would resort to, you know, maybe one of the, uh, the, the, the things I learned in composition, you know, on, on, on R&B songs, right. you know, you know, don't do this, you know, this, you know, a uh, parallel fist or, you know, maybe, maybe you might not want to do that. Contrary motion might be good right here. You know, just tools that composers would, would, would use. Right. I would use a lot. You know, and, and, and it really helped me. The education really helped me. Yeah, I alluded to how ambitious you were because at, at, I'm thinking back to when I was college age. I went to NYU for a semester, but I wasn't as focused until I got older. But you were like Juilliard School of Music in New York, CW Post, studied under Billy Taylor, and then, you know, into professional career. What were those days like? You said you always wanted to play music for a living, right? Yeah, I, I wanted to be a composer. I told my my teacher, yeah, because he would he would bring the you know the music because uh, he had stacks and stacks of music in his house, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and he would pull out some music and I said I want to I want to be like one of these guys, you know, have their name up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was the little guy, you know, saying I want to be a composer. <laughs> so it was like you know, he said, okay, all right, but um, it's just I, I always thought that way, you know, I always thought I could do it, and, right? Uh, because. I could I could hear a song and almost play it, you know, from just hearing it on the radio. I could go over to the piano and just play the chords, you know, to the song. And um, that's why my mother told me to take lessons because right, you know, smart. You have, you have a good ear for music. You know, yeah. you should learn how to read music. You know, um, 
uh, this professor went to our church and you know, she arranged for me to have lessons for her. So that was, that was uh, my education in music really, really helped me as far as being a composer. And then you, uh, you, were, you were in Teaneck, New Jersey, right? Yeah, um, yeah. my sister and, and the rest of the Isaacs had moved to New Jersey. Okay, why, why did they move to Jersey? Um, well, you know, they wanted to be, I think they wanted to be around what was going on in the music business. And that oh, was okay. New York or LA at that time. Right. And the cheaper to live in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> New York, LA, Detroit. You right. Know. And, you know, some, you know, like I said, Stax and Memphis was involved, but those were the big hubs, you know, mm -hmm. for, for music. And uh, they, moved, they moved to New York. And then eventually they got a house in New Jersey in Teaneck. Okay. Houses, they, they they bought houses in Teaneck, and so that's you know that's why uh, I went to New Jersey because my sister was married to Rudolph, right? And um, you know I would I would go there and you know Ernie played drums at the time, so we would kind of jam. You know we'd go go to his mother's house and we'd jam, you know play play different songs that I knew, you know, and Ernie would you know he would you know play along you know. I was, I was playing like Ramsey Lewis stuff and jazz stuff at that time. Right. Young Ho Trio, you know. And, um, but then, you know, we started to get a little chemistry going, you know. And I said, well, look, you know, um, we could use a bass player too. <laughs> at the time, Marvin wasn't playing the bass. Oh, okay. So we said, Marvin, you got to learn how to play bass, you know. You got to right. learn how to play bass too. So we, can, so we can, you know, get the bass um, part. To, to what we're doing here and make it make it sound more complete, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, you know there was a Ramsey Lewis trio, you know, young Hub, young Hope trio. So, so we could we'll, we'll call ourselves the Jasmine trio, <laughs> right? Just just pick the name out of the air, you know. And so uh, Kelly obviously bought Marvin a bass, and so you know he started to practice, you know, and he would you know practice the songs we were playing, and you know, he got better and better. And so, you know, we, we started doing gigs, you know, in New Jersey. And um, at, 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 at one point, uh, you know, Ronald took us in the studio down in, it was a studio in Inglewood, because they used to come and listen to us all the time, rehearse, right. you know. And he said, you guys should maybe record some of the stuff you're doing, you know. And so uh, Ed Townsend, um, uh, he was a, a songwriter, you know, mm -hmm. wrote stuff. Uh, Rita Franklin, and eventually wrote stuff from, for, for uh, Marvin Gaye, too. Uh, Let's Get It On, I think he was a co-writer on there. But he had a studio in um, Inglewood, and, you know, Ronald took us down there, and we started recording some of the original stuff that, you know, we had, plus, you know, some of the covers that we did. And, um, you know, it was a real good session, and, you know, so at, after that point, you know, they started wanting us to play on, you know, the records and and tour with them. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how the, the six member group got started, you know, from and that's why it's called three plus three, that first album. Oh, okay. Back in seventy three, right? Seventy three. Three plus right. three was the first three and then here comes the second three. And right. We kinda, we kinda joined together, you know. But it's how two, we, yeah, go ahead. You know, just two groups coming together. Right, right. How exciting was it? Uh, that first tour for you guys going out? I mean, yourself and the younger guys playing with, with the established guys. It was exciting. It was, you know, I remember the first few dates, we, you know, we had nerves, you know, kind of nervous, you know. Right. We're playing in front of big crowds and everything. But um, as, as time went on, you got more used to it. And, um, it, was, it was good. It was a good experience. Learned a lot. Yeah. And, and of course, the Isley Brothers, no Memorex, right? You guys were playing live, and yeah, we we're playing live. All, yeah. the, all the mistakes and all—it was the real <laughs> deal. Yeah. yeah, if you make a mistake, keep going. You know? Yeah. Did you travel with your keyboards, or you had it on backline? Um, at first, we started to—we would rent stuff. You know, the promoter would rent. You know, like if we needed a rose or you know um, a clavinet or something, uh, they would rent keyboards. You know, make sure they were there. Um, but after a while. You know, I start. I started to get my own keyboards. Okay. And then we had we got roadies. <laughs> yeah. Stuff just started to build. You know, we got right. a light sound crew um, that that traveled with the roadies. You know, 
two trucks of equipment, you know. Yeah. Uh, it got it got really complicated after a while. Staying in better hotels. Yeah, same hotels, you know, yeah. same it was like each town looked the same because you know you you, you pull into a hotel, yeah, and look too different, and then right. you pull you know the backstage of a of an auditorium they don't look that different. You know? <laughs> it's almost like you're playing the same gig every 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 day almost. Yeah, it's funny when I, when I meet musicians and you say, "Oh yeah, when you played in this, this gig at this and this year," they're polite enough to say, "Oh yeah, yeah," but it's tough to remember all the details and specifics on that, right? <laughs> It's, but it's a good experience, you know. You, you get the audience's reaction to, yeah, so, yeah. You know, it's like, and um, sometimes that can, sometimes that that gave me other ideas, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for for the next album, you know. Because I remember after a gig, well, no, before a gig, um, because we we had a guy who tuned our guitars. He would come in, okay, show everybody's guitars in tune and. Even if we were on stage, if they went out of tune, he'd hand you another, hand another one. You know? you know, if you broke a string, you know, he was able to another one. You know, but uh, uh, I was sitting in there, you know, just playing with the guitar and came up with Showdown. <laughs> you know, came up yeah. with the Showdown, riff, you know, right there in the dressing room. And I was like, okay, well, this is something we can work on when we get back. You know, go back home. But um, you know, playing live, you, you can get ideas. You know. Because you can play riffs that maybe you didn't play on the record, but you know, hey, that sounded pretty good. Maybe maybe you can build on that. You know, which, which uh, other big bands did the Isaac Brothers tour with during during the seventy three to eighty three? Just about everybody: Brothers Johnson, uh, Risa Franklin. You know, especially when we did those uh, those Budweiser tours. Yeah, yeah, right. I remember going to them. The jazz festivals. Right. It's on the Shaka Khan, you know, the uh, Funkadelics, you know, you name it. They were all there, you know. And um, but you, you, but because of the um, the length of the show, right? You know, and you didn't get much time to really socialize, you know. Because, oh, okay, right. Okay, we got ten acts, so we got you know, you know yeah, two, three, four, you know. And after after it was over, you end up wanting to maybe get something to eat and go go to the next gig, you know. Did you prefer going on earlier in the, the bill or later in the bill? Um, we kind of learned after a while, it's better to go on like a little bit earlier <laughs> instead okay. of later because, you know, people get tired and they would, they yeah, would yeah. You know, after nine acts, you know, yeah, it's like almost all night, and, you know, it's after right. midnight and, you know, people want to go home and, you know, and so it's better to get in there like maybe if it's 10 acts, maybe seven, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, because then the whole crowd is still there, you know? Right. But yeah, I remember seeing, um, I don't know if you guys were on the bill, I doubt it, but it was uh, Luther Vandross and uh, I think Patti LaBelle was at Madison Square Garden. But I think that was a little bit after you guys did Budweiser Superfest. Yeah, um, yeah. The super, I think the Superfest was over. With IJI, when we did the Caravan of Love, we oh, took okay. Lose a bunch of a whole national tour. When it was oh, okay, great! It was great. I mean, great musicians in his band, right? Yogi Horton. Standing all every night, both, yeah. both both acts. You know, we we would have standing all, then Luther would go on, he get standing all. Wow! And, you know, it was a great, great experience. You know, because Luther Luther is you know he he came to all the sound checks. You know, wow! And, you know, yeah. Everybody was singing. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. the right parts and the musicians playing the right parts, you know. And um, yeah, he had a tight show. Was really? Marcus Miller playing with him back then? I'm not sure, right? Was, but I, I know it was a very tight show, and yeah, he just yeah, he, right. right. Yeah, he's definitely missed and sad how he passed away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the songs, I mean, the catalog, we know the hits, uh, Fight the Power, and you know, no, you know, did you know writing between the sheets how impactful it would be? Do you say that this is going to be, this is going to be on the, all the late night songs, the jams out in New York and all the big cities? I knew it was going to be good, you know, yeah. but um, it turned out to be even better than I thought because um, 
you know, it's, it's basically a keyboard song if you listen to the music. Right. Okay. Yeah. And um, I was I was trying a lot of things in there, especially at the end, you know, because the, the chorus kept going, and I said, I think it needs an ending to the song, you know, something to change. Right. And then that's when I added the 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 ending of it, which sounds totally different from the first part of it. <laughs> right. It has like two sections to the song, but it added a lot of interest too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some artists sampled the first part, and then uh, I think Jay Z sampled the, the last part, you know, on one of his right. songs. And it was like, um, and then Whitney did a song that involved the chorus, you know. So people, yeah. different parts of that song, you know, and um, I knew it was a lot. I knew it was a lot of special things going on in that song, you know, the chord mm -hmm. structure and everything else. Um, and um but it but it really it really took off you know like like right away you know program directors jump right on right. you know but sometimes it takes a little while for right. you know your, your song to build you know and right uh, but uh, that particular song took off right away did your wife margie break it at bls um well she wasn't a bls at the time she, oh, she had, okay this was after she you know, we, we actually got married the day after we finished recording that album. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Wow. And so, um, you know, she wasn't there anymore, but um, everybody played it. You know, yeah. it was like one of those songs. Everybody just, ooh, yeah, we like this one. We're going to play it. You know. Do you have a, a couple favorites of artists who sampled it? And um, Well, Biggie, he sampled it. I think his was the biggest sample. I right. Mean. Yeah. There was a lot of samples in between the sheet. You know, like yeah. I said, Jay Z sampled it. And Whitney sampled part of it, mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, not a uh, lot of other people that I can't name right now. Because yeah. it, was, it was at one point in the in the um, early nineties, late nineties, and early two thousands, I was getting a, a sample from um, EMI almost every other week about somebody doing a, a wow. cover between the sheet. I mean, a sample between the sheets. A lot of rappers, you know, yeah, you know, because because they like that A section, you know, mm -hmm. the chord progression, um, and uh, it was just amazing the response that we got from that song. Right. Yeah, of all these years with the Isaac Brothers, and then 1983, you guys, some of you went your own way, and let, let me ask you a question because is it possible for these mega groups and multiple personalities and money and everything? Is is it inevitable to let Bands are going to go like this and have disagreements, or is it possible to stay together for that long? Well, it's um, it's not inevitable, you know, mm -hmm. that people are going to break up. But um, generally, sometimes what happens is sometimes it could be something just as simple as personalities, you know, mm -hmm. people not getting along, you know. Uh, other times, most times, it has to do with business, you know, right? Some inequity. Uh, in the business relationship, that's usually what causes a breakup. Right. You know, um, even with artists and labels. You know, what I mean, um, maybe they feel the label isn't you know um, being 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 fair with them. You know, and they want to leave the label. You know, a lot of times that happens. You know, but it's usually, it's usually has to do with business. So how contentious can the like, hey, I contributed this and. You contributed to this, and I should be getting more. It, that are those stressful times. That happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe one person is contributing. You know, most of the the writing or, or whatever, and um, sometimes the label will, will, will would cause for a, a solo album from that person. Right. You know, I think that might have happened with the Commodores. You know, Lionel Richie. Mm -hmm. Right. He was contributing a lot. You know. And his songwriting, and you know, he was the lead and everything. And, mm -hmm. You know, um, and it happened with the Jacksons. You know, right? And, uh, he was he was contributing a lot. He was their lead singer. Um, and some sometimes there's, there's like I said, this this personality relationships that yeah <laughs> work. You know, right. and, you know, I mean, uh, some people think they're more important than others. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I yeah, I remember uh, 
backstage before a show with a friend. He, he's a blues uh, artist out of Chicago, and we're sitting there and we were talking. And before the show, he had to spend like an hour talking with his band members to, you know, get them straight as far as maybe they were complaining or felt slighted about so some some whatever problems were going on. It's almost like, you know, you have to get that squared away before it, you know you hit the stage and like that. And mm -hmm. you know, I can imagine it's tough. Yeah, yeah, you know, and um, it, you know, it's it's not a guarantee that that, that a group is always going to stay together, you know. Right. But um, you kind of look, you, you kind of hope for that, you know. Um, but if you, if it doesn't work, you know, you have to you have to you know just go go another way and. Uh, you know, that's what we did with I, IGI, yeah. Isaac Jasper Isley. So no regrets, steady forward, right? We just, you know, it, it wasn't working and we just continued to record like we were recording before, you know, except for somebody else was doing lead vocals. You know? Right, right. That's right. <laughs> now, now listen, now, Isley Jasper and Isley, yeah. Caravan of Love, that song, it's timeless. Today, you could drop it on the radio, the lyrics the sounds, it, it fits, you know, everywhere, right? Yeah, that's that's a song that I knew was gonna do well, just because of how I felt in the studio, and you know, the the title, the message in there, you know, I just knew that was gonna do do well, and it did, you know, and it, right. it was an international hit, you know. Now, now you uh. I remember watching the other day when you went on video soul with Donnie Simpson, you guys were doing a promo tour, but you were under the weather. I think it was the last interview yeah, you were doing. Last stop on a promo yeah. tour. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. been everywhere, you know, all to LA and back, you know. American Bandstand too, yeah. Yeah, American Bandstand. Right. Uh, but that was that was on a, the Super Bad album. I was touring on the Super Bad album. Okay, first okay, album. that's right. Yeah, right. When I was talking to Donnie, and um, your, your solo work, yeah, yeah, that that was that was a good album too. That was a good experience too. Um, and not too many artists get an essential CD release or album release, but you have the essential Chris Jasper and everything. Was that I forgot? Was it on Rhino or CBS? I was uh, Sony. Oh, was, Sony. Okay, um, yeah. Um, and um. You know, we kind of had a, a, a deal with that. With that okay. Um, but that, you know, it has a lot of songs that I did, that I wrote, and that I performed on, on The Essential because it covers a lot of, it covers a lot of material. It, right, it goes, right. Um, you know, IJI to my solo work, you know, and uh, which is a lot of songs. <laughs> you know, but yeah. every song's not on there either, you know. Yeah, yeah, they got to edit some of it right you know my brother told me one day on the phone i was talking to him and he said you know chris i think you have more songs uh that you did solo than you did with the group <laughs> and i said i'm right. gonna check that out you know, i'm gonna check that and i, and I think i do i think I have, yeah I, I, have more I mean seven I 17 so albums that was for sure right right yeah so 17 solo records how how do you stay consistent as far as you know, people can check out the discography and see how consistent are you as far as writing and getting, you know, mm -hmm. getting the, your thoughts and playing onto on the tape. What is it? Uh, how do you do that to stay that long doing that? That's one thing I pray a lot and, you know, okay. ask, you know, guidance and inspiration. But, um, you know, mechanically, uh, I think over the years you, you, you will develop your personal system. Okay. How you approach producing a song, you know, but you first have to have the good idea before you produce it. And the idea comes, you know, from usually from practicing, you know, um, sometimes, you know, song can just pop into my head, you know, and um, I have this thing where I can hear all the parts playing in my mind before I start it. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. It's a gift, I, and and I always think I always think uh, composing and songwriting and you know uh, creating something new, mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a gift. Uh, you know, every 
everybody, you know, even in, you, you can have some musicians that are great, you know, they're virtuosos on their instrument. But when you ask them to compose a song, that's different. You know, right. that's a different thing. And sometimes they, they might have trouble doing it. And but they're gifted in one area, you know, where somebody else is gifted in another area. You know what I mean? Um, so there's all kinds of gifts. And I, and I think um, composing is one. I don't know why I can hear things like that. I can hear, I can always hear where, you know, we had to take a song, you know. And Chris, what do you think about this? You know, and, and I'll, I'll sit there and listen to it for a while and then start playing it. And then, you know, like uh, I, I say this on one of the videos uh, um, that I did, uh, Afternoon with Chris Jasper, Sony Music Lounge. That's oh, okay, right. I remember, yeah. A lot of the covers, you know, like Hello, It's Me. It's like, you know, Ronald wanted to do Hello, It's Me. He liked it. And then, you know, he, he had, he, he vocally, he knew what he wanted to do in the intro. But musically, there was no chords. There was no nothing. <laughs> you know? And, you know, I said, well, you know, I, I, heard, I heard the first Hello, It's Me. But I could hear, okay, that you could take this another direction. You can, I can use some of these chords that, you know, from, from the Romantic period to make it sound totally different than the, than the original. And um, that's, a, that's a gift, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm blessed with. And I, I, I don't take it for granted. You know, I, I always thank God for it. And you don't have to uh, book studio time and wait. You can go right down into your studio and start yeah. creating, right? That's true, yeah. That's a good benefit, yeah. It's changed a lot <laughs> yeah. for, for the studios are concerned because, you know, it used to be a big undertaking just to get started. Before you even right. started recording, they had to line the machines, you know, you know, mm -hmm. had to get the right, you know, real, make sure that you had 24 track machine if you had 24 track, you know. And if you wanted to use more than that, you know, you had to lock them up <laughs> to get 48 tracks. You had to lock the machines up, you know, and they had to make, oh, it was a big, it was a big thing, you know. I remember when I first got started in radio, we had the reel to reel and we would cut it and have to mark it and splice it with a razor blade and tape it together. Oh, that was, that was tough. Yeah, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, for music, even tougher. It was totally different. Now, right. now, you know, you can edit doing cut and paste. You know what I mean? Right, right. It's much easier, the, the editing process. Yeah. But what's not easier is coming up with a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Now, that, now I saw I saw the TV special you're doing with um, the local TV host who came to your house a couple times, and I saw some of the keyboards in your studio. How many keyboards do you, do you uh, have, and how many do you usually work with? Um, I'm just looking around here. There's six, seven, no, seven, eight, nine that I can see just by looking around, but I don't use that many of them. Okay. Some of them I just keep just because they're, you know, the classics, you know, mm -hmm. like Prophet Five and, you know, there's classic keyboards. I don't even use that one anymore. But um, because, and the reason for that is a lot of sounds, you know, you can get from different programs. Right. Computer. You can get the exact sound you can get from a keyboard from a program. You know, so uh, I'll always go with what's best for the song. You know, if, if, if it's best for the song for me to use a keyboard that's outside of the program, I'll do that. But if I can get a sound from the program that's, you know, matches the sound that I want, I'll use that. You know, um, I'll use whatever works. Right. <laughs> now, now speaking of what works, you've got a great new single called B Number One. There's a video out you can purchase, I'm sure, for, from the various music distributor. You can go to goldcityrecords.com. We'll have the link right down in the description here on YouTube and goldcityrecords.com. I I be number one, one, another positive song. And, and tell us about writing this song. It's got a lot of funk and a lot of soul and, and the video also. Yeah, I, I started the song because I, I wanted to write a funk song for the funk album that's coming out okay next month oh um, okay you get a compilation of the funk songs i've done in my solo career mm -hmm. not all of them but a lot right. of them. um so but i wanted to write something new right for that album. 
So I knew it had to be funky. So I started from that from that uh, concept of, of it just being funky. But then uh, usually when I do funk songs, there's some kind of message in it. You know, I, and, and, and the message that I wanted to um, get across was the message that I, that I put in this song is that, like, believe in yourself. Believe that you can achieve things, you know, that, that, that you've been thinking about. Maybe you had goals that, that you wanted to reach. You know, you, you have to stick to it because, um, you know, like, like I wrote in the song, there's a, sometimes there's people that, you know, tell you you're not going to do anything. You know, I don't believe, I don't believe you can do it. Yeah, right. But then there's got to be something inside of you. You know, and I, I use the phrase, but well, there was power in my soul. You know, I, I, I believe that I could achieve something if I stuck with it. And, and, and um, that's, what, that's what's common in all the people that we put in, in, the, in the little video that's in, in, that, that the song has. We, we did a, a video for the song. And we, we had a lot of people that have achieved great things with obstacles in front of them. I mean, huge obstacles in front of them. But the, the thing they have in common is that belief that I can get, I can get through this. I can, I can achieve, I can overcome these obstacles. And um, that's, that's what that song is about. How, how do you and Margie and your family do with the pandemic? How, what was that like for you guys? Um, it wasn't too different. I mean, we stayed, we stayed home a lot, you know, mm -hmm. but you know, we do our work from here. Right, right. And I record. I recorded an album during the pandemic. You know, right. It was a, it was an album of covers. You know, mm -hmm. it was called "For the Love of You" because I, I covered that song. Right. It was a song by Sam Cooke. You know, but it it was a, it was um it was kind of strange though because you know you, you you turn on the news and you hear what's going on you know and and especially, especially when it first happened. Yeah, yeah, New York, yeah. Nobody knew what was going on, and you know, people were dying all over the place. And but um, um, it was it was just a strange thing to go through. You know, um, I'm glad we all came out of out of out of it okay. You know, right? Yeah, it was uh, definitely changing for just about everybody involved. You know, yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So hey, let me ask you. Um, I touch base on all the illustrious awards you've received. Uh, I got to ask you, right behind you is the, like the clear glass, the, the that's pointed. The songwriters, songwriters uh, Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. So that's the latest one? Yeah, the Songwriters Hall of Fame. The Grammy, a lifetime achievement award is under that one. And the okay. Hall of Fame is over there. I don't know if you probably Hall can't. Of fame. Hall of oh, fame. yeah. Uh, let me see. There's, there's a Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, that's got to be gratifying for all that. I, I mean, that, that says a lot. <laughs> it, does, it does. It's, uh, but like, it's funny starting out, you, you don't think of that stuff. You know, you don't think of awards. You know, you just think of, can I, can I produce something at least at the same level as the thing I just produced before? Right. <laughs> you know, at least maintain some consistency. You know, and that's 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 the main thing that I was thinking about. It, I always think about when I'm when I'm doing something new. I said, you know, it's got to be something that someone might hear, maybe at our peak when we were at our peak, and say, hey, that's good. Mm. You know. Um, well, I know uh, a lot of the cover bands, a lot of the funk R and B bands, still play "Fight the Power," and it just fills the dance floor. I mean. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. great, it's, great song. It's just, just trying to maintain the level of uh, excellence. Trying to, you know, just trying to, trying to do your best. You know, just right. like, just like anybody who's a, an athlete, they always, you know, just try to do their best every, every time, every time. When, when's the official uh, release of this new record, the funk record? Uh, the, the official release. It was just released on uh, July first. That's, that's when it, you know. YouTube and every, it hit YouTube and, and, and a lot of other places. No, the full record. Oh, the no, the, uh, the album. The album, yeah. The album is um, mid August. Oh, mid August, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. That's that's when that was going to hit, and it's uh, it's called uh, Chris Jasper delivers the funk. <laughs> oh yeah, 
That that's guaranteed. You never a lot, stopped. A lot of folk on there, you know. Every yeah. song, song. So, right, I, right. I, haven't, I haven't done that before. You know? Right, right. Because uh, I released some ballads, a lot of ballads together, but I've never released a lot of funk songs. One right. after. That that that's the kind of record that when when we were buying records to be they release records on Tuesday, but you make friends with the shop owner. You go Monday and he open up the box and give you and sell you the record a day ahead of time. That's a record like at least for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah those were great times. Yeah, yeah, the, the record stores. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me ask you about uh your co-producer Michael Jasper. How's he doing? Oh, Michael's fine. Michael's yeah. fine. He's, you know, he's he's a you know he's a lawyer. He, 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 yeah, yeah. He, you know, he he works at this firm and uh, doing uh, uh uh you know promotions and things. He's oh, very okay. creative. He's very creative. Mark. Yeah. Uh, Mark. But he but he also you know when I start when I start a song, I like to get his opinion on the the rhythm tracks. You know. Right. Because he's got he's got a knack for that. You know, maybe to make him make it sound a little bit more. You know, modern, uh, for mm -hmm. example. You know, um, but he's got a good, got good feel for rhythm. And um, I'll say, okay, rhythm track's done. Okay, now let me get started. <laughs> so, I'll, what what, what kind of law is he uh, doing? Um, well, he was doing real estate, and he was doing um, just you know general general practitioner. Oh, okay, for, yeah. You know, um, but he's doing a lot of marketing now for this other firm. You know, oh, they okay. Like, they like to have attorneys, right, right, uh, in their firm. So uh, he's he's fitting in really good. You know, he's a really smart guy. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good guy. I was going to say good kid because I met him when he was a kid. <laughs> but yeah, good guy. Yeah. He was a kid. Yeah, he was he was still on the Fairfield. Uh, That's right. Yeah, he actually I met him before he was at Fairfield. He was in high school, I think, still playing high school ball. He came by the studio with the. Right, with, with the CD, he was... He yeah, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, he was the fourth film. That's right, that's right yeah. And, and you wrote a song for his wedding, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So your lovely wife has made appearances on your record, and is she on the new record? Um, not this record. The one, let's see, the one before she was on. Right. The, the single before, but not this this one, this one. It was a kind of, this one's kind of a macho, you know. Yeah. <laughs> She yeah. understands, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you got married on Valentine's Day, right? That's right. Yeah, I still remember. Yeah. So we finished between the sheets on February 13th. Wow. And we got married the next day. It was scheduled for that, or you just said we're in the mood? Never forget. It. Never forget. It. That was right. that was just what happened. I mean, I think when we were mixing and you know finalizing that album, I think I stayed up for two days. Wow doing that and back was, then we could right <laughs> yeah that's right yeah. Do it now, but, uh, back then yeah I, you know just you know grab something to eat get some coffee and get back right back in there right right <laughs> you know i remember like yeah i stopped djing parties in 2020 right before the pandemic and it would like towards the end it'd be like you know you do a gig you're lugging the equipment it would take you like two days to physically recover but in the old days it'd be like three gigs within 24 hours on different parts of town, but you get older. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah. yeah. You have more, not more energy. Exactly. So Chris, man, it's great to reacquaint with you after a few years. I mean, I know you were very supportive of our show, making the drive from uh, New York down to Connecticut. And then we moved upstate to New York. So we're, we're a fellow New Yorker now. All right. All right. Yeah. I guess they call it downstate where you are, and I'm upstate. You're upstate, yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll reunite in person. What was that? I said we'll we'll connect in person. Oh, yeah, yeah. We'll connect again. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I like your spread at your house. You're, I, I mean, I saw the outside look really nice, real peaceful. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot changed since then, too, since since that interview. I mean, this, this place is crazy. Margie said, you know, you because I like I – like, Architecture because I went to school for architecture too. Oh, really? Okay. I was gonna I was gonna go to school college for architecture, but I, I had all this experience in music, so I went to Juilliard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Decision to which way to go. So right. you know, but um, I like 
architectural design and you know landscaping and design it's like a, it's like a botanical garden outside <laughs> yeah it's like you got like a little japanese garden feel to it it's real it looks real nice that, that part that showed on the interview is like a small little segment of the the, the property oh okay it's like it's crazy i can't believe it when i walk up there i said i put because there was nothing on this it was really nothing on the property when we moved here wow there's so much now it's like it's crazy so you put I, your I, roots I, have, I can't do it by myself anymore i have to have people come in yeah you don't cut the grasses i don't cut the grass no. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing this. No, yeah i have somebody do it for me man, because right yeah that's it it's too big it's too it's too much stuff out there yeah when we moved up, when we moved up here, like, you know, when we moved past, you know, we get involved moving the stuff physically. My wife said, nah, you're at the age right now. We're, we're going to pay somebody to move all the way up here, the whole thing. So yeah, yeah. It, it yeah. Pays me it's yeah. worth it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so, uh, remind our viewers and listeners, uh, in August, August 30th, you said it's about middle of August, maybe like, you know, uh, I, I don't have my calendar now, okay. but right in the middle there. Uh, 15 yeah. something like that. Gold City Records, Chris Jasper. And the title again is? It's uh, Chris Jasper Delivers the Funk. All right. Chris New Jasper song. Delivers the Funk. And be number one. Yeah, be number one out there right now. You can you can yeah. uh, purchase it. You can watch the video. You can listen to it. We've been playing it here, and we'll also be having on our Mixed Call show with this interview as well. So, hey, Chris, brother, man, thanks for, for stopping by again. I know this is we're, we're close to double digits for your parents. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you know, we, we've done we've done a, uh, quite a few interviews, but uh, it's always nice, you know. Yeah, You're a good guy, man. I, yeah, I, you've always I, been helpful for us. Yeah, and and a lot of musicians, trust me, they they, they watch when you come on. They're always interested. I because I talk to them and they're, you know, you're well respected and influential within the music business. Well, that's good. That's good. I mean. Yeah. Anything I can do to help, you know. Yeah. I, I like to give advice sometimes, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why that's why I like to put positive messages in my songs. Because right. maybe somebody who, you know, they might need to hear that message, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So give our love to uh Margie and Jasper, the rest of your Margie and, and Michael and the rest of your family. Yeah, I certainly will. Yeah. We got a tornado warning here tonight, so <laughs> So I thought it was going to be more exciting than having you on. We were going to have a tornado crashing through. <laughs> don't, don't say that. No, no, but it, but it didn't. So, hey, thanks, Chris. That's good. Thank you. All right. I believe I